Hey everybody, it's Colin McEwen from the New Fly Fisher. Thanks for joining us. We've got a really great program for you tonight. We've got Mike Crosby from Flowers River Lodge here, and we're going to be talking about Atlantic salmon. Uh, this is one of the top rivers in the world, and this is the owner of Flowers River Lodge. We're going to talk about patterns, the seasons, what to do when you're going to Labrador, a whole bunch of stuff. It's going to be a great evening, lots of video. Stay with us, and I'm going to start it off with some Flowers River fishing porn. For 20 years, I've had the distinct pleasure of hosting and producing the new fly fisher. In those years, I've visited some truly amazing places, but there's one destination that stands out, an incredible land that calls me back year after year. That place, Labrador, known as the Big Land. It's 113,000 square miles of untamed and unspoiled wilderness. Each visit, I feel my body, my mind, and my soul are replenished and renewed. It is a supernatural land. This pristine, rugged, and unforgiving land is home to some of the best fly fishing on the planet. A place where massive brook trout will delicately sip a dry fly off the surface or viciously hammer a mouse pattern. Truly wondrous, a thing of angling dreams. But on this trip, my focus is on a species I genuinely adore and respect. Atlantic Salmon The Atlantic Salmon is a defining element of Labrador, representing the very essence of her wild, free-flowing rivers. To watch an Atlantic Salmon savagely swirl behind a riffling wet fly, or rise with purpose to a dry fly are among the most exciting experiences in all fly fishing. Majestic and powerful silver leapers. They captivate, excite, and frustrate, which is all part of their appeal. On this trip to Labrador, I'm returning to a river that I haven't fished in over 14 years. A river that is considered by many hardcore, world-traveling salmon anglers as one of the top waters to cast a fly for the king of game fish. Welcome to Flowers River. Come join me on my adventure to a destination where fly fishing dreams become a reality. Welcome back everyone. And as you saw in that video, I am an Atlantic salmon addict. I mean, I do have a problem. I love Atlantic salmon. I got hooked when I was in Nova Scotia and I was in the Navy and I was learning to fly fish and I started with brook trout and I love those fish. But then I caught an Atlantic salmon on the Marguerite River and it was all over. I still have the addiction. And I gotta tell you, it was such a thrill to go to Flowers River. And that's why I wrote that piece to let you know how much I love them and why anybody out there that's watching this, if you haven't tried Atlantic salmon fishing, you want to go. You want to try this once in your life, at least. And on that note, I want to introduce you to somebody else that has the same addiction as I do, Mike Crosby. Hi, hey, well, how are you? Good. So Mike's coming to us from uh, beautiful uh, Nova Scotia. 
Uh, it's a little later in the night there, and I appreciate you staying up, uh, especially on a night when uh, hockey season first started uh, here in Canada, and a lot of people are like focused on the Toronto Maple Leaf game or Toronto Maple Leaf and Hab game. But you know, I, I got to tell you, I had so much fun at Flowers River, and I'm so excited about the show that I produced there. Um, I mean, it's an hour long show. We don't do that. It, it oh, wasn't your fish, just the pipe. I mean, Mike. It's your place. You talk about it. It's fantastic. It's one of the most incredible places I've ever been. Well, you know, we, we were lucky to get you there last year with, uh, you know, with the issues that came up with COVID-19. I know that you worked hard at it and, and we worked hard to get the people in place and, and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, we were super happy that, that it all worked out. And, and uh, I was really excited that when you left Flowers River, your comments to me were that Mike, I think I just shot the best Atlantic salmon show that I might've ever shot. And so uh, for me as a lodge owner and, and please keep in mind that I'm a co-owner that I do have a couple partners in flowers river. And, um, but as a lodge owner to hear those words, I'm thinking, thank heavens that, you know, that it all worked out this way. And that was great. Well, I had a, a really wonderful time and uh, I want to give people some context. Why don't we talk about where, in Labrador, the Flowers River is, um, why the runs of fish are so good. I'm gonna show some videos. I got a lot of video for everyone out there to watch. Um, and while you're talking about it, I'll actually put up some photos of some of the fish that are caught. I mean, this is a river that's known not for a good, not only for a good number of fish, but for the quality of the salmon you have there. So why don't, we, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about Flowers River? Sure. Absolutely. Well, you know, the Flowers River is a river. I started salmon fishing at a very young age. And, and when I was, well, I say very young age, when I was 16, when I was old enough to drive. And as luck would have it, on the very first day that I went to the river, I caught a salmon. And as you said, that was it. I was done, finished. I've told people for years and years, I asked them, I said, have you ever you know, gone Atlantic salmon fishing? They say, no, this will be the first trip. I said, well, don't go. Stop. Save yourself because it can become an addiction and for me it certainly has so when we learned um oh, a number of years ago that the flowers river was uh available you know was going to come on the market for sale we had some experience with other fishing lodges and we, we decided to make you know a play for the flowers river and we were successful in our bid to get it so that was that was great but then we we had ever actually never been to the river we'd never fished the river and we purchased it before we ever did that. Um, but then we went off to the Flowers River and I began to realize why it was that, that you know, people saw in it what they saw. It was, a, it was a river different than anything I'd ever seen before in Labrador. And, uh, and we're just super happy to have it. So, you know, as far as where it is is concerned, um, you know, it is 160 miles north of Goose Bay. So, you know, when people... I attend fishing shows in the you know, United States and other places. And people say, where are you? Well, I said, you know, go here and then just keep going north, okay? And, and the Flowers is the most northerly of all the scheduled salmon rivers in Labrador, okay? So there's, there's other rivers above the Flowers River that have uh, runs of salmon, but not of a, a nature significant enough um, that they would be a scheduled fly fishing only river. So 160 miles north, uh, and our camp is located about 20 kilometers from the salt water. I mean, when you're when you're doing something like that, you need to put it in a place where you can land an airplane, and and so that's where the camp ended up, and it was there long before, you know, before we purchased it, and and we've, you know, as you mentioned later on in in your video clips, you know, we've we've done a lot and spent a lot of money fixing the lodge up. Uh, a very small portion of what existed when when we bought it is still there. Um, the, you know, the main lodge is really all that still exists of what was there when we bought it and we've completely rebuilt it. Um, and, and we're pretty proud of what we've done. We still got some work to do. And, and, uh, last summer, albeit it wasn't a good year for getting our guests there. Uh, it allowed us to get a lot of the work done that we needed to and wanted to get done. Well, thanks Mike. Uh, that's a good introduction. And we'll, we've got a lot of things to talk about with the, the river. Uh, Labrador and of course the lodge. Uh, the Welsh fly fisher has asked a question. Uh, he wants to know if the tactics that you use for steelhead are the same for Atlantic salmon. And thanks for the kind words, uh, Welsh fly fisher. Uh, Mike, do you want to tackle that question? Well, you know what? I'll take a stab at it. 
and and I, I got a little bit of a problem with the stab at it because I've never fished for steelhead. However, uh, my partner, uh, Jim, has fished for steelhead and he did for many years. And there are a lot of similarities between steelhead fishing and Atlantic salmon fishing. Um, from what I understand, I, I think really one of the major differences is in uh, in steelhead fishing, a lot of times they'll skate their dry flies on the surface. And generally when we fish for Atlantic salmon, we tend to free float our dry flies. Not that the fish won't take them the odd time skating, but but that's one of the distinct differences, um, you know, between the two species. From there on in, I'm to understand that, you know, their fighting characteristics are similar. Um, and, and of course, the Atlantic salmon people always say that, you know, that the Atlantic salmon fights harder than the steelhead. The steelhead people say um, that the steelhead fights harder. And I think a lot of it has to do with the conditions um, of the fish, the conditions of the river, how fish, you know, how far the fish are from the ocean and stuff. But, but really, the, the main difference that I would know would be in dry fly presentations. That's about all I could, from, the, from my knowledge, that I could tell you on that. Okay. Uh, great answer, and I'll just say quickly uh, that I've fished both the West Coast for steelhead, the Great Lakes for steelhead, and of course Atlantic salmon, and there are similarities and there's differences. Uh, I'm not going to get into the battle about which one fights better. I think they both are excellent uh, fighters and a great sport. And I'll just say this. Um, one of the things we love to do is use a riffling hitch at times when the fish won't come up for a, a topwater fly like a bomber, but something going across on the surface in a riffling hitch, they'll hit. And a guide in Vermont taught me that steelhead in the Great Lakes, if the water is the right conditions, will come up and hit an Atlantic salmon fly like a blue charm on a riffling hitch on like the Salmon River in Pulaski, New York. So I guess the bottom line is there's lots of crossover and swinging flies is always a good way to catch salmon or steelhead. But it, I mean, it's all about the conditions, time of year, and what, what the fish are like. So what I'd like to do next, Mike, is introduce the first fish. Um, as I said, it's a one hour show that I did. And, and uh, for everyone's context, what I did, which is kind of unique, is I thought the best way to approach uh, doing the show was to break down my experience for the seven days every day from the day I arrived to the day I left, everything I did. So um, what I'm gonna show here is my first fish that I caught. And uh, I think that people, hopefully people will like the way I did this when this uh, show premieres on, it's on World Fishing Network and Sportsman's Channel this week and on the weekend. But I think a lot of people will be watching this on YouTube, which is this Saturday at uh, noon, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But let me show everyone a video clip uh, my first fish. Chris, am I doing it right or am I putting it in the wrong place because I put that fly over that fish half a dozen times now. Colin, just cast a little closer to him. You're up a little bit too far. Landed about two or three feet in front of him. Let it float down and he'll take it. I guarantee it. Oh, look at that. Oh, ho, ho. it's a nice fish. It's gotta be at least eight pounds. But to get this on a little tiny, it's, it's almost like a bug, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, uh, this is a number eight B bomber. B bomber. Yeah, great fly on the river. Oh. So one of the things Chris was reminding me as this fish jumps is to bow to the fish and take the, keep it tight, but let it, let the rod take the shock so you don't break the tippet. Oh, he's right in front of me here. Oh, it's a nice fish. Beautiful colors, fresh. Let's see if I can get them to you, Chris. I'm gonna back up here. Yep. Back up, back up. He's gonna go yeah. again, I think, here. Yeah, he is. He's, He's thinking about it. it. Got his head oh. up. You can tell I'm excited. My hands are shaking. This is so much fun. Catching a big salmon like this. Okay, so I'm gonna walk back to you. He's right at your feet, gone. He's right at my feet. There you go. Ah. That is Nail. that is awesome. Awesome, 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 awesome. On a little tiny dry fly. All right, you don't want to stress this fish. It's a nice male. Hold him up here. I'll pull the net. You want to hold him? Yep. 
Show them the camera to keep in the water. Look at that. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Beautiful Absolutely. fish. Absolutely. Around eight to 10 pounds, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful fish. Always fish, release the salmon upstream. He's ready to go. <laughs> and that is why you come all the way to Labrador. Great job, Flowers River. Another pump there, buddy. Awesome beyond words, awesome. See that head come up and we're having to work. I mean, there's lots of fish here. They're making us work, but to catch them on a little tiny fly, that's a bubble bee? Yeah, bee bomber, yeah. Bee bomber. Wow. Awesome. I think I counted seven awesomes there. Yeah, there was a lot of awesomes. <laughs> but it didn't show that I was excited. Um, and uh, interesting note, the bee bomber or the bee bug, which is used for Atlantic salmon and is very effective in Labrador and, and, and other parts of Atlantic Canada, uh, they also use that same fly for steelhead on the West Coast in British Columbia and down in uh, Washington State and all the way down to California from what I understand. It's a very popular fly. Been around since uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, I believe. But, uh, and I wanna mention, by the way, that was Chris Sinclair, my guide, who I had for the whole week. What a fabulous guide. Uh, Bill Spicer had him last year at Crooks Lake Lodge, a Brook Trout Lodge, which you also uh, are an owner of, Mike. And uh, wow, what a, you've got some really great guides at that lodge. So I uh, hope everybody liked that. Um, and thanks, uh, I see Deborah said, I like the pictures of the salmon. Uh, I'll put up some more here in a few minutes and we'll show you some more big salmon. But Mike, uh, why don't we talk about your guides? I mean, you've assembled a real solid team of guides and that's so critical for this type of fishing. Well, you know, it, it, it is Colin uh, and, and guide selection is, is one that I primarily leave up to Terry Byrne, who runs the camp for us, because you know he's going to be there. You know I'm going to be at the camp several times during the summer. He's there day in and day out, and and Terry is a master uh, fly caster, fly uh, fisherman guide. He is really, um, really, really great. So you know we trust his decision in in picking guides, and 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 you know, we've been pretty fortunate. I mean, it's it's tough to find great guides as well, because I mean. You got to look for somebody that's willing to work seven days a week and go away and stay in the woods all summer long and and uh, with a bunch of other guys. And so, um, you know, we've been lucky and uh, and most of our guys have been with us you know, for uh, quite a bit, you know, quite a period of time. Chris has been with us uh, really uh, only a couple of years at Flowers River, but uh, he's been with us at our trout camp before that. So we knew. We knew the level of his skills, and and all we did was transfer those to the Flowers River, and uh, you know he's worked out really, really, really well. And, and of course, what you've got to understand too is that we get a lot of people that come that don't have a great level of skill when it comes to catching Atlantic salmon. You know they might be you know decent bro brook trout fishermen, they might be bass fishermen, whatever. Um, but there's only so many opportunities to fish for Atlantic salmon. And when, when somebody's paying you to be there for a specific period of time, um, you know, you owe it to them to put them in their best hands that you can possibly put them in um, to increase their odds of catching fish. Because, you know, Atlantic, I had a steelhead guide one time tell me, and this is not that I was steelhead fishing, but talking to him on the phone, I had a, a guide tell me, he said, this is not a game of numbers. He said, it's a game of memories. And so you're only going to get so many opportunities to catch fish and, uh, and you, and you want to be, you know, at the, at, at the best that you can be. And a lot of that has to do with your guide for sure. I love that. Not a name or not a game of numbers, but a game of memories. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I said, you have a great staff and uh, Terry, I met him years ago. He's like, it's like the salt of the earth. He's, so oh, yeah. and what and what a wonderful man great sense of humor uh and, and everyone at the camp loves him all the staff. Have, you, have you ever watched him cast a, a fly rod it's I, I i did actually we went to top pool and yeah. i think he was trying to help me not feel bad about my casting <laughs> i i was told how not just the distance but how well he could punch out into the wind and drop a bomber so delicately into a run well i tell you what i always considered that i was you know 
a pretty average caster, maybe a little bit above average because I've done it for so long. Um, but I had opportunity to be fishing with Terry one night, um, just up from the camp on Flowers River, and and uh, and we had another guy. I said, Terry, come on, let's go fishing. And we had another guide with us, and so Terry was fishing, and I was fishing, and I'm fishing a nine foot nine weight, you know, single handed rod. Terry is fishing a, a nine foot three weight. And he is punching line out into the wind with a bomber on with that three weight rod. We both hooked up salmon. And we had a, we had a double hitter going. Um, turned out the two fish were like Terry had a 14 pound fish and I had one that was 17 or 18 pounds. We're playing them at the same time. And you know what? He landed his fish on the three weight in the same amount of time as I landed mine on a nine weight. So, you know what? There's If you're going to have somebody picking guides for you, that's the guy that you want for sure. Very skilled. Uh, the Welsh fly fisher has a question for you there, Mike, about uh, what... And you know what? And I'll, and I'll get to that one, but there was a young lady before that had a question, and she was asking about the size of fish that we catch on Flowers yeah. River. Yeah. And, and you, know, um, you know, difficult question to answer, but I'll say this. Um, I think that, and I've fished all over Labrador, and I've been doing it for a long, long time, um, and I think that the Flowers River has the largest proportion of large fish, you know, salmon actually, you know, fishing from the 10, eight or 10 pound range up than any place else that I've been to in Labrador. There's other places that have more fish, but I've never been any place that has more bigger fish. So it's not uncommon for us to see fish um, in the 20 and 25 pound class. I mean, we catch 30 pounders, um, you know, quite regularly. I mean, and, and, and if, it, if you listen to the guides, we haven't yet landed one, excuse me, over 40 pounds, but I've been told that there are people that have hooked them. In fact, Terry Byrne told me one night he was fishing at Jones's pool with a, with a client who hooked the fish that, he, that Terry claims was over 40 pounds. And this was like a first time salmon fisherman. And he put on one of those bee bombers and fired it out and this giant salmon came up and just gobbled it. And the way that Terry put it to me, he said, it was the biggest fish that he'd ever seen on Flowers River, and Terry knows big fish um, because he fished the Lower Humber a lot when when there was a lot of big fish around. He um, he knows big fish. He said this fish was over forty pounds, but he said the angler was no match for the fish. He said it was over in just a matter of a few minutes, and that was the end of it. And and it, he said it was just the wrong person to hook that fish. Um, anyway, so you know what, thirties are not uncommon. Twenties and twenty-five pounders—they're a fairly regular thing, and and lots of tens and fifteens. Now we get certainly get you know as the season goes on, we get runs of grills. But the interesting thing about the flowers is that a lot of rivers, whether they're in Labrador or Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, what happens is you tend to get a, a run of salmon that come first, and then you get a major run that comes after that, which is predominantly grills. And what what we found at Flowers is that. The, the salmon keep coming all season long. I mean, in September, you know, I could show you pictures of fish that you know, we catch in fish September that looks like fish that normal rivers catch in, you know, June and July. And so they keep coming all year round. And, and uh, but yeah, it's exciting. Every day you go out, there's the opportunity to hook fish in the 20 pound plus class uh, on Flowers River. It doesn't happen every day. Okay. And I wish that Chris Sinclair, I didn't see this in the video the first time I looked at it, when he said, I guarantee it. If you throw that there, I'm going to think, oh, I got to talk to Chris and tell him he can't ever guarantee that a salmon is going to take a fly. But anyways, um, so that's it. And and as far as rods are concerned for the Welsh angler, um, you know what? I would say that, you know, a large percentage of the people that come to Flowers River are still fishing with single hand rods, uh, you know, nine foot eight, seven, eight, nine weights, um, but evermore we're seeing people with switch rods and two-handed rods, and the Flowers River is ideally suited for two-handers. It is not, you know, it's it's not a brook, it's not a stream, it's a river, and, you know, some of these pools are big pools that are wide, and, and I will tell you that, you know, somebody that was good with a switch or spay rod would, would uh, definitely school me with a nine-foot, nine-weight, not to scare off the people with nine-foot, nine-weights, because I hold my own, but I know that those big rods, those long rods, um, are are um, are a definite a definite asset on Flowers River. Thanks, Mike. That's a great uh, work into the next video I want to show. Uh, Jeff has asked a question which I want to get to right now about before I go to the video. 
Because yep. the video I'm going to show is going to talk about the type of fishing you have, wading, boat fishing, stuff like that, which plays into the whole thing about rods. But Jeff's asking about what is the best month to come fish the Flowers River? Sounds like he's actually going to the Humber. Yep, yeah. I see that. Uh, hi, Jeff. Listen, um, you know what? Our season at Flowers River, we don't bring our first guests in until July the 15th. We, we tried it a little bit earlier than that. Some years it works out, some years it doesn't work out. So we've kind of settled in on July 15th to bring our first guests to the camp. We operate right up until the 10th of September. Um, and as far as best time is concerned, I would have to say every river, be it the Humber, be it you know whatever, the Miramichi or the Margarita in Nova Scotia, every river seems to have a three or four week window that if you had to say it was prime time, it was prime time. Um, the problem with that is, is the salmon don't always pay attention, nor do the conditions. If I had to pick it, I'd say probably from the third week, the uh, third week in July till the middle of August uh, would be when you might have the most amount of fish in the river. OK. Um, however, you know, there's times that you give things up You know, earlier than that, like on the 15th of July, there might be less fish, um, but they're predominantly all salmon, all big fish. And so that when you tighten up. You know, if, you're, if your main goal is to catch not numbers of fish, but big fish, that might be better for you. So, you know, Flowers has something to offer everybody. And again, not a game of numbers, a game of, you know, experiences and memories. And, and, uh, and but if I, had to, if I had to pick a time, that's where I would pick, cautiously, because I get asked that question all the time. And so, and there's only so many spots in there. You know, I can only accommodate so many anglers from this time period to that time period. And, and uh, you know, we operate the whole season. Fortunately, as I you know, said just a minute ago, we're, we're, we're lucky enough to have fish that are coming all along so that the guys that are there after the middle of August into September are not necessarily fishing over stale fish. Yep, some of them have been around for a while, but there's new ones coming all the time. Hope that answers your question. No, I think that's, I think, uh, that's a great answer for Jeff because uh, – it is tough to, to mark and uh, just to give some uh, clarity about that. Mike, remember the year when they had all the iceberg bits come down, all the icebergs off the coast and the sand oh. two to three weeks late? Yeah. Well, I've seen them. I, I've, I've seen them later than that, Colin. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw one year where we were fishing the Eagle River in Labrador, which normally I'd be really happy to fish on like the 5th of July, anytime around there. Um, and we were there on the 29th of July, and we had 12 anglers in camp. We fished for an entire week on one of the most prolific salmon pieces of water, salmon water in, in North America. And I think we hooked a total of nine fish between 12 anglers. The fish just didn't come in. They were still out in the ocean. Yeah. Now, so there was a year when the person that was going to come later on thinking that, okay, I'll be a little bit off time, they would have hit the mother load big time. So. It is. It's fishing. It's not catching. It's what happens. So. Yeah, and they're migratory fish, and there there is a lot of variables here. But yep. uh, for everyone's uh, perspective, when you watch the video this weekend and this next video, I came. The you had me come third week of July. You just well, you were there. Well, you came on the 18th of July. Yeah. And in a normal non-COVID year, we would have opened three days before that. So there still would you know there would have been you know decent fishing had you come three days earlier. It just so happened this year you came because that's when we were going to open the camp because of the whole, you know, COVID restrictions and stuff. Okay. So the next video I want to show everybody, uh, I'm really excited about because one of the great things about the Flowers River, which is very unique because in Labrador, most of the rivers are tannic stained and the flowers is crystal clear. It's unless there's been a heavy rain that puts a little tain in it, the water is very clear. And we're in the boat, I'm with Chris, and we're sight fishing. We're spotting the fish and fishing to them. It was so much fun. Have a look at this. Right there, don't move. Right there. How far off? Right there, two of them. That's him right there, right? Am I fishing to the right thing? Stand up and move. Right there. Oh, sh you missed it. Rest them. Yep. Oh, that's a decent fish. 
Here he goes. So Chris walked me into this fish. You could see him. I kept going too far or too short. And he helped me a lot on the angle on this fish. And uh, he even said, let's change flies. It was the third fly that worked. He had recommended a tan bomber with orange hackle. Oh, look at that beautiful fish. And he's getting ready to go again. He's saying, why am I? He's gonna go in under the boat. Able. Sweet. Nice fish. Okay, I'm gonna bring him up quick and he'll either come at you or he's gonna go. I know he's gonna go. All right, you ready? Oh, there he goes. Couldn't go to shore with him, but he's not that big to go to shore with. I got him in the corner of the mouth. I saw it. Okay, there he goes. One round. You want to lift me off? Yep. One, two, three. Okay, thanks. It's the worst thing about in the boat. <laughs> yeah. Part of it though. Yep. I'm gonna bring him up towards cameraman. Uh, uh, there we go. That was outstanding. And you know the best part was getting him on a bomber. Like that was awesome. He he came up, I saw him turn on it but I didn't feel the grab so it you know it didn't set the hook and then we had to wait rest him and then took three or four casts got it in there Chris helped me boom fish on he's going back in okay There's that word awesome again. That was yeah, it, <laughs> we've had quite a few of those. <laughs> so um, I think what I wanted to bring on uh, line here by putting this video clip in was the type of fishing you have at the river, which is great in my mind, because it's a combination. You know, you go to some salmon rivers and Mike, you're way more versed in this uh, than I am about the different types of salmon fishing in Quebec. New Brunswick, Ontario, or uh, uh, excuse me, Nova Scotia, and Labrador is that you have everything. You've got, you can fish from the boat in certain places. You can spot mm -hmm. fish. Uh, you get out and walk and wade in some spots and very safe and easy wading. That's what I really, really like because I've been to places where honestly I feared for my life if I took the wrong step or it's very slippery or the gravel is pulling away from my feet the whole time. Very, very generally easy wading and reasonable casting distances, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the type of fishing you have there as I demonstrated a bit from the boat, which was rock solid, by the way, the, the uh, sure. sand boats you got there? Well, yeah, we use, no, those are big 22 or 20, no, 26 foot um, canoes. So they're pretty stable, but you know what? Surprisingly, um, we don't do a lot of boat fishing on the Flowers River, unless when you were there calling the water was a little high. And, and certainly, you know, we've got all the, all the canoes are equipped with side anchors and anchors so that you can fish out of them. Um, but most people prefer to get their feet in the water if they're physically able to do that. And, and the first time that I went to the Flowers River, which was actually after we agreed to buy it, um, when I came back, I told my partner, I said, you know, this will be the last place that we're ever able to fish Atlantic salmon. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, a lot of the places we go, the rugging is difficult. Uh, the waiting is rugged or difficult or dangerous, but I said Flowers River is one of the, you know, it's a very low gradient for the most part, slow, deceivingly slow river, um, but at the same time, um, enough current and heavy water. Uh, I've had some of the greatest battles that we, uh, with Atlantic salmon that I've ever had at Flowers. So, you know, we've got it all. We've got, you know, slow moving water, faster moving water. We've got, you know, rapid -y kind of water, but generally, the waiting is super simple and you know what we've got customers that come you know well into their 80s um that are out there waiting every day in the flowers river and that's one of the things that attracted us to us because you know 
in, in general, our salmon fishing population tends to be aging and we wanted to be able to not only fish ourselves, uh, we wanted others to be able to enjoy the sport as, as long as they possibly could. So, yeah. Uh, Jim Weatherwax from Colorado is asking about uh, what's the travel like? How, like? Can you give us an atypical kind of story of how to get to sure. the launch? Well, you know what? These days, of course, there is no typical because everything is in uproar. Um, but in, in a normal time, um, you know, most of our anglers <coughs> would fly to Halifax, Nova Scotia, either through Montreal or Toronto, um, a lot through Toronto. So if you were coming from Colorado, you'd fly from wherever to Toronto, Toronto to Halifax. And then generally there's a flight that leaves Halifax. So you could leave Colorado in the morning, make a connection in Toronto, get to Halifax that evening. And there's a flight that leaves Halifax generally uh, you know, around 5.30, 6 o'clock in the evening, gets in Goose Bay at around 7.30. And then you know, we've got our own um, young lady that goes to the airport to pick up our anglers. And we, we actually built our own bunkhouse in Goose Bay. Um, you know, the, the, the hotels there were, well, they were, they were booked a lot in the summertime because there was a lot, a tremendous amount of labor work going on with a, a huge project that was going on up there. So we found it difficult to get uh, accommodations and difficult to get good accommodations. So we build our own accommodations. So you arrive at night, say 6.30, 7, well, 7.30, 8 o'clock, somebody comes and picks you up, brings you to our bunkhouse. In the morning time you wake up, we feed you breakfast. Well, it's a continental breakfast there. You'll get your real breakfast when you get to the camp. And then the float plane base where we fly out of to go to the lodge, and it's about an hour and 15 minutes flight. We fly a twin otter, so there's two engines. Um, and the twin will leave, and you know generally you'll be to the camp at about 10:30 in the morning. You'll arrive. The chef will have something ready for you to eat, and you'll get your license. And you know by lunchtime you'll have your lunch, and then after that you know you're gone fishing for the rest of the day. So um, you know I don't know what we're going to find with COVID-19, and I, I hazard to guess at what travel will be like. But you know lots of people that we have from Upper Canada, or from the north, you know the eastern United States, or from out west. Um, and we do have a, a number of customers from out west as well into Halifax, up to Goose Bay, Goose Bay on the float plane into the camp. So it's, uh, it's pretty simple in that regard. It's long, um, not for the weak, you know, the faint at heart, but, but it's, uh, it's not all that complex. And to give uh, a little bit of perspective to everyone, uh, having gone to Northwest Territories, having gone to, I mean, all across Northern Canada, Alaska, it's about the same travel time. You're basically looking at one day of travel and overnight to get, and then hopefully into the lodge, and it might be two. And I found it's actually quicker coming out than it is getting in, just to make sure you're there for first thing in the morning to get on the float plane to go up to the lodge. And yeah, uh, if, you, if you miss the float plane, it's a 160 mile walk. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to take a little while. Um, so, uh, what probably the best thing. Right now, I, I think everyone, there's some people are asking about fly patterns and things like that. Why don't we, if everyone's okay with this, I'm going to play another video. Because I got a lot of video here. And I think if you're like me, I like watching video. Um, and especially because it's all about me. Uh, why don't I play this one, Mike? And then let's talk about fly patterns, okay? Sure. Uh, absolutely. That was an epic take on this little dry fly. Chris walked me in and the fish, if it's the same one, oh, he's coming right at me. So why you need a large arbor. That's a good sized fish. And I'll hold him here. Chris, you want to come on over? Here he goes. Yeah. He, might, he might take a run, so. Whoa, it's a big fish. I'm gonna keep his head up, head up. Nope, it's all right. There he goes. Over here. Oh, that's a big fish. Okay. I'm gonna go this way. Put the head up. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> that is an absolutely beautiful Atlantic salmon. Look at how fresh it is. And what do you think it is? Maybe 15 oh, pounds? Over 15 for sure. 15 yeah. to 18 in that range? Yep. Beautiful. Ready yeah. to go. Yep, ready to go. 
Long journey from the ocean. More awesomeness. Well, I tell you what, I'm getting pretty excited myself. I know. And we're in January. It's so yeah, I know. to watch. I know. And I'm sure everyone out there watching this is going to be crushed. And uh, I'll just say this. When you watch on YouTube this weekend, you're going to really love, I mean, because there's a lot more information in there about the whole total experience, what we brought, the rods, the lines, everything. But let's talk about fly patterns, Mike. Sure. Uh, and I want to show everyone this one because this was my honey for the week, the bee bomber, or even the shorter version, the bee bug. What are your favorite fly patterns? Uh, did you bring some for us to look at there, Mike? Well, I did. And, you know, I, I over the years, I mean, I, I used to, when I you know, first started Atlantic salmon fishing, I figured you had to have every fly that had ever been tied and made and, and I used to carry just an unbelievable array of them. And I've got it narrowed down now, Colin, that doesn't really matter which river in Newfoundland and Labrador I, that I go to. I take a half a dozen different patterns. You know, I might have a lot of them. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for me to have, you know, four or 500 of a particular pattern. Now, that's a little bit obsessive, I know. Um, but I don't want to run out of them when I'm there. And, and lots of people come to me and say, well, what are you using? And so I end up giving a lot away in the run of the year. Anyway, um, there's no question as far as dry fly is concerned. And, and you had a, a you know a great picture of the bee bomber there. And, and, and actually, there's one right there. I don't know. Can you guys see that? You put it up uh, more towards the camera. There you go. A little higher. Mike. Wait a sec. Where am I? You're going oh, up. there we are. See it? Uh, Okay, so there's one. Yeah. Okay, and you'll notice that's another one. The one that you put up there had white tails on it. Yeah, white wings. This is, this is one of the original ones. And and they, when we got there, they were tying them with black. And they used them in a lot of cases so small that you'd have those black tails and a fly that was black and yellow with a black hackle on it. And you'd fire it out. And I, my eyesight's not that good. I, I couldn't see the fly anymore. And so I'd end up pulling when it wasn't the right time to pull. So we put white wings on them. Um, so that they were easier to see when they hit the water. But I will say this, and I'm going to try to be better at getting in front of the camera. As far as the wet flies are concerned, my number one go-to fly, and I did a Facebook post on it a couple of days ago, and I'll get this up here, is a little, I keep going the wrong way. There it is right there. You can see it against my forehead. It's a glitter bug, isn't it? Well, it's, it's a, it, it maybe started years ago as a green machine, and then I kind of adapted and put a white tail on it. And then I put a little crystal flash in the tail. And then I make the butt out of a, out of a, a chenille rather than a floss or a, a yarn because I want the butt to be approximately the same width um, as the rest of the body when I trim it down so that it's – anyways. And that may just be me being me. Uh, Is that a call of Mike special? No, no, there is a Crosby special, which is way different. I just, I call this a white knobber, but, but, but that's just what I call it. Other I people call I, it. We need to tie me some of these. Well, yeah, they, yeah, uh, not on the flowers, but in Newfoundland. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's um, the first, we also own a lodge at Hawk River in Labrador and completely different river. As Colin mentioned, the, the flowers is clear water. And there's lots of times that you can see those big soakers coming up to take your fly and it's unnerving. The Hawk is a very tan colored river. The first time I ever went to Hawk River, uh, the fellow that we bought it from was there. And, and I asked Astor, I said, Astor, did you ever use anything like this bug on the river? And I showed it to him. Well, I said, that won't catch fish here. And at the end of the week, he had his hand up. He says, anyway, I could get a couple dozen of those bugs from you because they just, the fish just destroyed them there and they, they love them everywhere. Um, uh, I got to jump in here. That fly. Yep. Pardon I, me? Um, I was on the Gander River. Yeah. At the end of uh, first week of September, I had the same thing. I had to give all my patterns that I had left. Yeah. Because it just killed them. That's such and, a well, it's You know what? Hawk River is just, you know, it, it's, it's this, I fish them on the pin where the hawk, eagle, wherever I go, I fish them. It's my, it's my number one choice of flies. After that, I start scratching my head, figuring, well, if they won't take that, what will they take? But you know what? We've got some other ones. This is a, uh, we're going to get it back here. I call it a green glitter. Um, again, it's uh, just a, it's got a green butt and a golden pheasant tail and a green diamond braid body. Um, you know, a throat like a general, like a green Highlander, yellow and green throat. And, and you know what? On all of my wet flies, 
um, that I use now, moose hair is the wing. If it's got a wing, it's moose hair. That's it. I threw away all of the squirrel tails that I ever tied with, the gray squirrel tails, black squirrel tails, bear hair and everything else. For me, I have moose hair that I, a particular, you know, I like it a certain way and, and that's what I use. That's it. And, and almost, almost without fail now, I end up putting some kind of a little bit of a flash in the wing. Doesn't matter what fly it is. It's, it's got some, some kind of flash in it. So that green glitter is a great one. And as is, um, a blue charm. Wait a second now. I got to get up to there. There we go. Um, and again, our blue charm or my blue charm is a little bit different than, than, uh, I keep, I don't know why I'm having a, such a hard job to keep it in front of that camera. Blue charm, a little bit different than a traditional blue charm because I use a fluorescent green for the bot instead of yellow that it would have called for. And, and again, moose hair in the wing, but you can see, if you can see it well, there's a little bit of, of blue, um, crystal flash in the wing as well. Um, not a lot, three or four strands of it I put in. Uh, everybody pretty much knows a thunder and lightning would be another one that would work well uh, in a wet fly pattern. And uh, here we go. In Labrador, pretty much everywhere, Flowers River, no different. So really, when I go to the river, one other one that stands out is this one that we've only been using now. I shouldn't even show this. Uh, we've only been using this now for a few years at Flowers River. It is the simplest, ugliest thing that you'd ever fish with. It's just a, a chenille body with a, a, an olive, olive, then a, a, a band of magenta, and then another band of olive with a little bit of moose hair in the wing and a little bit of green um, hackle as a collar. They call it a marguerite bug. And one of our guides, uh, again, exemplary guide, Daryl Burry, uh, turned us on to that one. And now I'm catching fish with it everywhere I go too. So it doesn't matter the river. I put that one on. So really there you have it. You know, people say to me all the time, how do you catch so many fish? You know, you must have the best flies. I said, well, I only got five or six flies. I said, how I catch so many fish is that I'm there every day. Um, and I mean, it's like any game, you know, the more you're at it, the more you're going to be in the right place at the right time. And that's really it. But as far as flies are concerned, five or six patterns and, and that's it. No secrets. That's it. Look at my box. There they are. Confidence flies. Yep. Yeah. I have that for trout, bass, everything. I, I, I'm always looking for the new one. Yeah. Like, you know, the Marguerite bug or bomber. I mean, it, by the way, uh, Tim Flagger, uh, who's a very well-known fly tire in the United States, uh, tight line productions on YouTube has a huge following. I told him he's a big fan of the Marguerite River. And as soon as I, he said, have you got any Atlantic salmon patterns? I said, well, I've got this one that Chris and Claire showed me. And he goes, i gotta die. I got to do that fly. <laughs> two weeks, it's been assembling all the right, what are the materials, how do they fish it, all that stuff. So it just went up today. Well, you know what? The funny thing about that is I can't, I mean, we've got a camp on the Marguerite and we've had it there since 1990. So 31 years. I've traveled up and down the banks of the Marguerite River, and I can't ever find anybody that knew anything about this fly called the Marguerite Bug. I don't know where the name came from. I really don't. One of those top secret ones. One of those top secret ones must be. Well, thanks for showing those flies, uh, Mike. And, um, and I'm sure uh, if people had more questions, some of this information is on your website. And, of course, they can all, always call you and ask yep. you for some of this information. But uh, before, Deborah, before we go to your leader size question, um, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's answer that. And then I want to talk about the lodge because some people are asking some information about the lodge and I'd like to show them some videos. So can you right. tell them, you know, explain to Deborah what the best setup is? Sure. Hey, Deborah. Listen, uh, as far as leader is concerned, I tell people, you know, come prepared. There's no tackle shop 160 miles north of Goose Bay. Um, and I would say the majority of the time you're going to be fishing on the Flowers River with eight pound test leader. OK, whether you choose to use. You know, tapered leaders, straight leaders, uh, fluorocarbon leaders, whatever else it is. Generally, um, you know, average would be an eight pound test. But I tell people, bring a spool of tan. If you get there in big high water uh, and you happen to hook a, you know, a 25 or 30 pound fish, you, you want to have something that you can, you know, you can deal with the fish with. Likewise, you know, we had a stretch of really warm water, not warm water, but warm weather last summer. Um, as August went on, we had like a number of days where it was over 90 degrees Fahrenheit every day, which is totally uncommon, 160 miles north of Goose Bay. Um, 
And so we had people say, switch to six, you know, put on your six pound test leader. The fish are getting a little bit more finicky now. So if I, if I was going and I was going to take four spools a liter, I'd have one, six, two, eights and one ten, And that's what I'd go with. And I don't use tapered leaders either. That's just me. I just use straight level leader. If I'm using eight pound test, I put on 13 or 14 feet of eight pound test. And that's what I go with. I do exactly the same thing, Mike. And I use uh, same like 10 to 12 feet. Is what I like, generally speaking. Okay, let's talk about your lodge. And probably the best yep. thing, Mike, uh, why don't we show everyone a little video that discusses what the lodge looks like, what the accommodations are like, and what they can expect. Flowers River Lodge is ideally located several miles upriver from the ocean, nestled on the river banks between majestic hills. It was constructed of red cedar logs some 60 years ago and was recently renovated with a kitchen, dining room, and two private bedrooms, each with their own ensuite. There are numerous beautiful log cabins for anglers, two of which can accommodate two anglers each. More recently, a stunning three-bedroom, six-person log cabin was just completed, which is absolutely palatial. From solar power to a hovercraft, Flowers River Lodge is constantly updating and improving its services for guests. Another reason why it has become so popular with fly fishers from around the world. Well, I can tell by that shot, I was pretty stressed there. Um, <laughs> so can you explain to people what they can expect in terms of your accommodations, the food, everything when they come to Flowers River? Sure. Well, you know, it's... Uh, since we bought the lodge five or six years, my memory is, is a little bit, not that great, but five or six years ago, we bought, you know, Flowers River Lodge. And when we bought it, we knew that it was going to be a long-term investment. And we knew that we were not buying structures. We were buying the ability to fish on that river for the rest of our lifetimes and, and to be able to provide that experience for others. So with that in mind, you know, we undertook um, to redo a lot of the lodge and uh, you know, we, we, we kept the main structure the way that it was, at least for the time being. We're going to do an addition to that and, and extend it out closer to the river and put a dining area out there. Um, but we did, as you said in the video, we did redo the main lodge so that we do have two. We have two single rooms in the main lodge because odd time, you know, we'll get somebody that either travels as, as a single or uh, has a special need or request for a single we can't always accommodate everybody. People call, you know, and, and say, can I get a single room? And I say, no, it can't happen um, because we only have two of them and they're already spoken for. Um, but generally, you know, we don't get that many. So we have a couple single rooms and they're in the main camp. And then uh, as you, as the video said, we built two 16 by 20 uh, uh, brand new log cabins with uh, their own bath. And, and, and those are great. And then the, 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 the last building we built column, which was, the, the big one that has three guest bedrooms, you know, all double occupancy, um, has two two bathrooms in it and stuff like that. And as you said, you know what, we did a nice job building it. And I will tell you this, there's nothing inexpensive to build in Labrador because every log, every nail, every screw um, had to be flown in on a Twin Otter aircraft. So, you know, you know the longest log you could have would be 16 feet. Um, and, you know, the payload is not that great. So what what costs a, a certain amount of money to, in Nova Scotia. Then we added a lot of money to it for a truck to take it to Labrador and then to fly it stick by stick in, we built it. And it's quite an accomplishment to have built what we built in the middle of nowhere, you know, doing the way we did it. So, you know what, we did all that because we wanted, we went out and we bought hotel quality mattresses and hotel quality pillows and hotel quality um, beddings because you know after a long day we want people to make sure they have this one thing that we can control there's lots of things that we can control some are out of our control we can't control whether the fish bite or don't bite we can't control whether they come out of the ocean or not so we need to control the things that we can control one of them is our accommodations and 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 things like you know your bed and bedding and stuff and seems small but i'll tell you what i've had so many people over the years come back and say that was the best sleep that i ever had um, and as far as, you know, the kitchen is concerned, we were really fortunate last year. We, um, we, we moved from having camp style cooks, uh, which were great. Um, but we, we really found is that the palates of our anglers was 
above the level that we were cooking to. So we had great food, good food, um, but it was camp food. And, and last year we upgraded, we hired ourselves um, you know, a full-time chef. And I'll tell you what, Cindy um, was a godsend. She accommodates everybody almost to a fault. Um, but you know, when you get up in the morning, every morning, there's fresh hot muffins made and, and you know, we let people choose what they want for breakfast so that it's not just coming. You're going to have this. You know, we ask people what they'd like to have the night before so that, you know, if they want an omelet, they get an omelet. If they want this, they want 11 eggs. They can have 11 eggs. It doesn't matter. And so, you know, most people will come back to the camp for lunch and, and we're flexible with that. If you want to stay out, um, I can see somebody that must know me well there because they put up that lobster bisque thing. That's a special recipe I have in my cookbook. Anyway, um, Cindy does a great job and she took us to a whole new level and she's excited to get back with us last year. And we've just, again, we've got a great staff um, there, right, you know, right from our, you know, our, our shore person to uh, the people that take care of the rooms and to the kitchen staff and stuff. They, they really are. They really are pretty exceptional. We're lucky to have them all. So that's it. It's comfortable. It's in the middle of nowhere. Now I will say this, just so that you know, people. Here's a question people always ask me, Mike. What are the flies like in Labrador? My only <laughs> question. My response. My you think you do it, Mike? I'm going to bring that up in the next one. My response is come prepared. If you're a person that doesn't like black flies and mosquitoes, uh, you know what? Labrador is going to be an experience for you. Make sure that you bring. Um, you know, good insect repellent. Make sure you bring if you, you know, if you really don't like them, bring a buff like Colin head on and or bring a head net, um, which I don't, I don't think I've ever put one on uh, when I was fishing. But you know what? If I needed it, I'd be glad that I had it. Okay. Most days you're out on the river and the flowers were lucky because it's a big river and you tend to be not wading re really, you know, up close to shore and, and the bushes where the majority of the flies are. So you get out in the river, there's a wind blowing. And generally that takes care of a lot of, you know, uh, of a lot of them. But to tell you that, okay, this is just like going to the beach and you don't need to worry about it. That would not be true. So it's just, I'm warning everybody, be ready. That's it. Yes, and the camp has, hey, Kevin, camp has 24-hour solar power, no question, so that, you know, people with CPAP machines and special needs like that, I'm actually one of those people now, um, <laughs> you know, that, uh, that um, you know, we don't have lobster an issue bisque. with that. What's that? Lobster bisque and wine. Lobster bisque, I got to tell you, that's a recipe you guys would want to be writing me for, for sure. Um, it, it's a It's a killer recipe. Well, listen, why don't we, uh, we've been doing a lot of talking here. Uh, why don't we put up another video? And uh, thanks for that explanation about what you have. I'll just caveat by saying, everyone, it's absolutely fabulous. And to reinforce what Mike said, you have no idea how difficult and how expensive it is for them to fly the materials in, to have it that when you're staying at those can at, at the different cabins, it's so nice, it's so comfortable. And if there are a few bugs, you get out of the bugs. The food's great. It's absolutely fabulous. And, and you're, you're not your cook, your chef helped me put, I think, about four pounds to my already COVID pounds uh, <laughs> with all her treats by the coffee, uh, coffee maker. So anyways, let's play a video and we'll come back and talk some more. Day five was starting off with a weather bang. Multiple fronts were coming through the valley, bringing heavy rain and winds. But both Chris and I felt it was magic time for the salmon. And it turned out we were so right.
That introduces our next topic, weather. Yes, uh, sir. And uh, as you saw, we were heading up the river, and this, you know, I think every day we had a front come through, at least one. That day, we probably had half a dozen fronts that came through, uh, but it was a blessing in disguise because even though it rained, oh my goodness, the fish just turned on. Every time it we get a cloud burst, it was magic time. And that salmon you saw I caught, I think it was a size 10 or 12 wet fly that I was riffing on the top of the water, and he just hammered it. But anyways, why don't we talk about how to be prepared, Mike, to come to Labrador and the Flowers River? What did you bring? Well, Colin, you know what? Um, I, I tell people, I mean, we've got a section on the website on it, and I tell people, look, um, you know, pretend you were going to any any other river except for um, you can get some you know, wild swings in weather in Labrador. It's, uh, you know, in in um, Celsius, you know, I, I've seen it be, I've seen it in July be four or five degrees Celsius um, in the morning time and be 30 degrees Celsius, you know, by the time dinner time comes around. Um, so I tell you, know, bring your regular, bring good rain gear, bring good insect repellent, bring good waders, um, and you know, bring a spare fishing rod for sure. I mean, we keep all that stuff at the camp in case of an emergency. But generally, you know, people are are uh, are uh, well, they, they like fishing with their own gear uh, and not something that they borrow. The big thing that I tell people is flies. I mean, I used to own a fishing tackle shop here in Halifax. People would come and see me and say, Mike, I'm going to here or there. And I'd know that their trip was, you know, this many thousands of dollars that they're going on. They said, well, look, um, you know, can you give me a half a dozen flies that, that, uh, you know, that, that I should take? And I said, no, I can't help you. They said, what do you mean? I said, put, you know, put a couple hundred dollars there on the table and I'm going to, now I'm going to help you. Um, because really, um, you know, we gave up the practice of selling flies at the camp. Um, the guides, um, you know, generally have some flies and we give every angler that comes to Flowers River, we give them a little box with a dozen salmon flies on it, particularly for that river. But if you're going to go all that way, spend all that money for heaven's sakes, don't stop short on the fly patterns and not patterns, the, the, the numbers of flies that you bring. So just come well prepared with flies. If you if you leave anything else out, you know, make sure you got your flies and a camera and sunglasses and basic stuff uh, like that, sunscreen and, and and things. So there's a big list, you know, right on the website, you know, what to bring and it'll tell you. And other than that, the only thing that I really emphasize is make sure that you have enough bait, bring enough flies for sure. <laughs> and I want to reinforce something you you brought up, and, and that is the importance of bringing quality waders, boots, and especially the jacket, the wading jacket, and layers. Um, folks, like you said, I was there third week of July. You'd be there in August. And I don't know if you noticed in some of the shots in the background on the hills, there's still snow. It, yep. And the weather, it, <laughs> and the guys just say, oh, yeah, that snow will be going, but it might not be gone until sometime in August. So I guess the thing is the weather can vary dramatically. And if you're coming to Labrador, yeah, got to be prepared because uh, for our friends in the States, we're talking one minute. It's going to be in the high 50s, low 60s, and boom, it's going to be 85 degrees. And then by two hours later, it's going to be raining. The temperatures drop dramatically, whatever. So it's just going to become prepared. And as you said, you've got it in your website. So I'm going to play another video. We're, we're, we're at the hour mark, but, you know, Mike, I think everyone's enjoying this. So let's play another video. And this is basically near the end of my time, the sad moment. But I got to tell you, sometimes you hit it right. And when I came to Flowers, I hit it right because that last day was magic time. As the day wanes on, Terry leaves us. And I jump at the opportunity to continue fishing with Chris Sinclair one more time before the end of my trip. Not bad. So it's about five o'clock. I was just about to recommend to Chris that we go in. I'm at the end of the run here, making a few last casts, and the famous last cast I got an eat and a nice sized salmon. And sometimes that's how it works. It's so great when it does. 
sweet. He's almost there. He's got one more jump in him. Yeah, he's good for one more jump at least. All right, bring him this way. Turn his head down river. There he is. Oh, we saw you. Yeah. What a powerhouse. This is the reason why you want a decent drag. Okay, so I'm gonna come back up. And turn him, turn him, turn him, turn him, turn him, turn him. Don't chase, don't chase him, don't chase him. Okay, here he comes. Head up. After that fish, we decided to stay just a bit longer. And then it happened. You gotta leave us with a little bit of a. You, know, you gotta come back for more. I gotta tell everybody you gotta watch the video this Saturday because what happened next was you gotta see it. It was just truly magic. So. Uh, one of the things uh, that I don't, I'm not sure if we talked about, Mike, was, and it connects to the lodge, is how many people is the maximum number of people you have at the lodge at one time? How many rod? Sure. Uh, maximum we take, um, Colin, is uh, is 12 sure. um, at the lodge at any one time. We What we do is we, we bring six at a time in from Goose Bay. So we have a plane coming every three days. We do six six-day rotations is the way that we sell our trips. And, and so, you know, if you come in on the 15th of July, you leave on the 21st and then there's a group that comes in on the 18th and leaves on the 24th. And we do that so that we can, um, we can be a little bit more lenient with the weight restrictions on the aircraft with, when we used to bring 10 anglers at a time, you know, what we told people, you know, you're allowed to be bringing 50 pounds of gear. And if it was 51 pounds of gear, you needed to find something to leave on the dock. Now we can be a little bit more lenient, but it also allows us to bring fresh fruit and vegetables into the camp more often uh, because instead of getting there once every six days, we're there once every three days. So 12 at a time up until about the 20th of August, we switch. Okay. And what we do then, um, and actually this is new for 2021, given that 2021 actually happens, but come the, um, Come around the 20th of August, I'm not sure the exact date, we go down to only bringing eight anglers into the camp. Mm -hmm. Now, there's plenty There's plenty of water for 12 anglers. I mean, it's a lot of river. We're the only camp on the river, and we've never seen you know, anybody else on the river fishing other than our guests. Even though in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, there's no you know, private water. Everything is public. The only thing that keeps us relatively private is that it's 160 miles from Goose Bay, and it's an expensive plane ride to get there. And once you get there... You know, you need boats and motors to get around and everything else. So, you know, lots of river to fish, but we go down to eight anglers later on in August to try to make up for the fact that, you know what, there may be slightly fewer fish around than there was earlier. But now we bring, instead of bringing 12, we bring eight anglers, and that allows people to have more flexibility in the pools that they rotate to every day. And if there's some pools that are better than others, you'll get in them more often than you would if there was 12. So, Anywhere from eight to 12, generally 12, but as it gets later on in the season, we go down to eight. Okay, so that goes to the next question. And it was actually something I really, really like about uh, Flowers River because as you mentioned, I mean, the whole river is basically yours to fish. You have 25 plus pools and runs that you send anglers to with the guides. And again, yep. on water conditions, time of the season, things like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, sure. You know what? We've, we've, we've got a rotation that we use so that it's fair to everybody. And invariably, you know, what happens when you go to a salmon river, whether it's in you know Quebec or New Brunswick, and I've been to most of them or a lot of them for sure. Um, if you go and a camp has got a certain amount of water, um, you know, if it's private water in New Brunswick or Quebec, well, they've got so much water. Well, invariably, there are some pools in there that are better than others during the time that you're there. 
it can change during the season. And gee, all of a sudden you're catching, you know, all, a lot of fish are being caught in a particular pool. And a week later, that pool's not fishing so well, but, you know, another pool is. So we rotate anglers so that on day one, this is the section of water that has three or four pools in it. They're fishing. And the next day they move to the next and the next so that every angler gets an opportunity to fish every piece of water while they're there. Okay. And that's about the most fair way that we can do it. And, and, uh, and it, plus it means that you're getting to look at different water fish and different type of water every day as well. Perfect. So I guess the key is there's lots of water, lots of opportunity, only a certain number of rods. You're guaranteed to have a great time. You know, so Aaron Miller here, uh, who's joined us a few, uh, a few times over the past few weeks, has got a great question here. You know, hi, Aaron. Listen, um, as your question, uh, do you ever fish the classic salmon, flies, chalk, squat, and stuff? I'll tell you what, over the years, um, I do, uh, and I have fished the classic salmon, flies. You know, when I started fishing down on the Hay River in Nova Scotia, well, actually, I started on the Gold River. Um, and uh, then I went to the La Have, and and you know what? We fished a jock scot, not totally fully classic, but it had all the classic body and stuff. We modified the wing because so it didn't have all the feathers in it. And I can remember distinctly uh, fishing on the Gold River, and one of the best flies that we had there was called. It was a pale yellow torish, a fully dressed pale yellow torish that Hardy Brothers used to tie or something. So I've caught salmon on all those green Highlanders and stuff. We I used all those. But like I said, probably for the past 20 years, I just been using the same half a dozen flies. Um, you just looked at them and, and I, although I, I used to tie those classic salmon flies and I've got a plate of them on my wall over here that I, I tied the last ones I ever tied in 1995. Um, I've tied them all, had them all, but right now today, it's just simpler to tie a simple fly, put on a bit of moose hair. I don't tie the neatest looking fly. There's lots of people on here tonight that tie a neater looking salmon fly than I do. And um, I just tie something that looks fishy. It's got a few strands of moose hair on it, a little bit of crystal flash in the wing, and off I go. Could you still catch them on those patterns? Absolutely. Might you go broke trying to buy flies like that? Probably you do that too. Um, but uh, so I just tend to keep it simple now, that's for sure. Well, uh, I think we've had a really fun evening uh, and I appreciate everyone's questions, lots of participation. And uh, some people are interested uh, in your cookbook, but also, uh, Mike, you know, a number of years ago, you and I were attending the same trade show down in New Jersey, Somerset, New Jersey. Yep. I said, oh, did you hear I wrote a book? And I go, you did? Do you have a copy of it there by any chance, Mike? Imagine my good fortune. I have a copy right here. Um, so I'm going to try to hold this up. Um, this is, where is it? Here we go. Ah, River Talk. Look at this. This is River Talk, and that is me when I had brown hair, not gray. Um, the key is now that I still have all my hair. And my wife and I were looking today trying to figure out, you know, it's like 10 years ago that that, that I published that book, and we self-published it. Um, and it's not a book uh, really so much about how to, because I really don't think I know how to, you know, much better than anybody else. Again, I, I get out more. And, and, and certainly like anything that you do, the more you're at it, you know, the, 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 the better you get at it. So I, I have the advantage of many years and many hours on the river. But I told, I started to tell the story of the first 2,000 Atlantic salmon that I ever landed. <clears throat> and for the first 2,000 that I landed, I kept a record of every one. I caught the pool that it was caught on, the day that it was caught on, what the weather was like. I had an exhaustive record of all these fish. So as I went back to write River Talk, I thought, you know what, it'll be pretty neat for people to find out about the places that I've been and the people that I've fished with. And there's stories in there of fishing with movie actors like Robert Duvall, the stories in there of the, the big 60 pound plus fish that I caught on the West River in 1988. And so, but I mixed in there some, how I learned some of my lessons on salmon fishing and some of the greatest lessons I learned by just watching, by going to the river and not fishing, just sitting on the bank and watching the best guys and what they were doing. And, uh, and so I tell all those stories in there, and there's lots of great Labrador and Newfoundland stories in there as well, for sure. And I still have some of them left around, and and uh, and uh, I don't really work at selling them much anymore. I, I I donate a lot of them to causes that raise money for Atlantic salmon, and 
and uh, and that kind of stuff. And and I mean, I still sell them here and there, but it's it's just me, and I don't have them in stores much or anything like that. So very cool. Very it was cool. fun. It was a great. It was a lot of fun. People say, "Gee whiz," you know that 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 I really enjoyed. I've had so many comments from people that said, "Gee, I I stopped fishing, but now I started again. I really enjoyed that and stuff like that." And I told them, I said, "Well, you know what? I was fortunate. I enjoyed landing a couple thousand salmon." Um, so that I could write the book like that. Now that was a long time ago uh, that I caught the second, the two thousand one. I, I have no idea where it might be now. It's a lot. Well, it sounds like a pretty, uh, a pretty special life. And and talking about uh, your fly tying, I think you're being a bit modest. I'm the guy who ties roadkill, but <laughs> my roadkill, it's all about presentation. You still catch fish, even with roadkill. I've got up your Facebook page, uh, Mike. So if anybody is interested in the book. Uh, obviously, they can reach you also through the uh, Flowers River. Uh, yep, absolutely. I, no question. Right. And uh, same with your cookbooks, which uh, I've got to get one of your cookbooks because I'm a fan of maritime food. I love, you know, clam chowders and lobster chow. I love, I mean, ch I'll I love tell you what, that, that lobster bisque that they asked, somebody asked about just a minute ago, that, re that recipe is in the cookbook. Oh, it and is? I, Oh, my heavens, I tell you what, we were tarpon fishing in Florida a number of years ago, and I got that recipe from a gal in Florida. We had some lobsters left over that we brought down there, and Debbie, who was the wife of one of our guides, Phil, uh, wonderful lady, we invited them all over for lunch. We ate lobsters as many as we could. There was lobsters left over. She said, do you want me to take those and make them into a lobster bisque for you? And I thought, well, what does a lady in in Florida know about making something out of Nova Scotia lobsters, but we were sick of seeing them. I said, take them, have at them. And next day she came back with this pot of bisque and it didn't have a name. I named it Florida lobster bisque because that's where she made it. And it's just absolutely a deadly recipe. And all the guys that I, I lobster fished with people for 27 years. I went out on the ocean lobster fishing as part of what I did. And I shared that recipe a few years ago with the guys up and down the coast. And now they're, well, they're, all addicted to the recipe. It's a good one for sure. There's a reason to buy the book right there. There you go. And we're not trying to sell books, right? No, it's not, not. But I, it, we're both cooks. I, you're much more proficient. I'm hoping to retire here soon. And and uh, when I do, my goal, according to my wife and, and my passion too, is to cook more. So I love you go. good food. Um, Mike, really enjoyed having you on tonight. Thank you very much. I got to say, I one of my best memories that I've had in my life, and, and I've had a lot of really good ones in my life, but going to Flowers River, wow, that was so special. The people there were fantastic. The fish, the topography, I mean, I love Labrador. I absolutely adore Labrador. And even though I got chewed apart a bit sometimes by the bugs and got rained on, it was hot, it was cold, absolutely worth it. Anybody that loves fishing will love going to Flowers River. And I want to thank you for being on uh, the show tonight, talking to us about the place, a place that's very special in my heart, obviously very special to you. And thank you again for having us. Well, you know what? No, no, you had me and I thank you for going there to do the show and hope everybody enjoys it. And uh, regardless of whether you ever get the flowers or not, if you've got any kind of a question that might come up about salmon fishing or a particular destination somewhere in Atlantic Canada that you might be looking for, you know, seek me out, find, because chances are, if you're looking at going there, I might have already been there at one particular point in time and uh, might have some information for you. And I'm always happy to answer questions for other anglers. Perfect. So have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to play a video. It's the trailer for this season. We've got lots of other locations besides Labrador that we're going to be talking about and doing shows at. So have a look.
Oh my gosh, that was awesome. There were two fish fighting for it. Both came and broke the surface and then this one just hammered the fly. Ready and go. Oh wow. Nice. That is absolutely wicked. So Chris has spotted and got me into first fish. We've seen some others. We just saw six go by us. There he goes. That was outstanding. And you know the best part was getting him on a bomber. Like that was awesome. Took three or four casts, got it in there. Chris helped me, boom, fish on. It's a fish factory, it's a food factory. Um, there's a lot of different ways to fish the river. It's it's just cool. It's uh, you know, it's 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 a pretty amazing place. <laughs> How do you like that 22-inch brown trout on a pheasant tail waiting in Montana? Nice. All right, so we're hooked up here to a nice big brown trout. Browns are not the dominant species in the bighorn, but you do have a shot at catching them. And when you do get them, they're generally pretty big. And this one looks fantastic. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! How do you like that? <laughs> what a fantastically large, aggressive wild brown. Adam had me thrown into the back, slowly stripping, and then dropping it off the legs. We saw the fish roll up even behind it. We slowed down the presentation and smash. Big old smolly. Oh my gosh, it's a giant. That's a tank. This is the reason we make the drives. This might be my personal best, boys. That might be my personal best. Scott, it. Okay. Sweet. Big fish. How's that? It's a big pike. That is a monster. Oh my goodness. Yes! Can you believe this? That is a big pike. Next, sweetheart. What an unbelievable animal. Rob, is that your biggest northern? That is my biggest northern. Congratulations, Thanks, buddy. Man. Ah! That's a stud. Nice fish. That's a big fish, That's man. That's a nice one. Nice. You had just said, too, we're going to pull a big one out of here. Yeah, we're going to find another nice one, right? Right in here somewhere. All right. There he is. Pretty good. What a dandy out here. Yeah.